Hello and welcome to the Synergos Cultivate the Soul session, part of the Synergos Global Gathering. So nice to see all of you. Today we are going to be looking at the theme, The Four Sacred Gifts, Indigenous Wisdom for Modern Times. The Cultivate the Soul series at Synergos explores the intersection of philanthropy, contemplative practices, and self-reflection. Today's session has been designed to be interactive so that each of you has an opportunity to learn new ideas and tools, reflect on them, and discuss them with your peers in this private setting. We have closed this meeting to members of our philanthropy networks and special guests to allow for private conversation. And we hope that you'll stay with us for the full 90 minutes and participate in the small group discussions so you have a chance to, to connect to each other as part of the program. Our speaker and guide today, Dr. Anita Sanchez has said, remember who you are and open your heart to true abundance and the intimate interconnection of all life. You can learn how to forgive the unforgivable, to heal, to unite with all life and to revitalize the hope that allows us to dream. Anita is an international leadership team and organizational development consultant, trainer, speaker, and coach. Her passion is bridging indigenous wisdom and the latest in science to inspire and equip women and men to live their higher purpose in service and joy. Anita is a best-selling author and has written the award-winning book, The Four Sacred Gifts, Indigenous Wisdom for Modern Times. You can see Dr. Sanchez's full bio on the Snergos website. Anita, we're so pleased to have you here with us today. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Melissa, and welcome all my precious relations. I'm coming to you from Boulder, Colorado, and I see in the chat that some are coming from different Lakota lands and different lands. Um, uh, this is in Boulder, Colorado. This is the land of the first peoples of the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, and the Ute and I give gratitude every day, and particularly now it's, it's summertime, and it's gonna be 100 today, so it's pretty hot. I wanna start first uh, with uh, a chant uh, to connect us all, to, um, to connect to each of the four directions, giving gratitude. It's a chant that I created years ago in walking this, uh, the foothills of the Rockies where I live. And so I was told later by a Seneca friend, do you know a few of those words are Seneca? And I said, well, isn't that amazing? All our ancestors know each other. And I know that's true in looking at all of you on the screen today. So with that, if you would like to lower, close your eyes and just imagine um, connecting to winds and giving gratitude to all the four directions as we allow ourselves to remember that we are all intimately interconnected. We are one hoop of life. And we'll start with to the east, the yellow direction. Da da ne ho, da da ne ho, nya nya swami ho, nya nya swami ho. Gratitude. And to the south, da da ne ho, da da ne ho. Nya nya swami ho, nya nya swami ho. Gratitude. And to the west, the black direction. Da da ne ho, da da ne ho, nya nya swami ho. Nya nya swami ho. Gratitude. And to the north, the white direction. Da da ne ho. Da da ne ho. Nya nya swami ho. Nya nya swami ho. Gratitude. And you may open your eyes and be here with all of us. And I invite you to listen with the softest part of your ears and expanding heart. 
to the eagle hoop prophecy. The hoop is an evolving symbol for humanity as its wisdom and presence reminds us of how to be and how to do. In 1994, a vision came to a Mohican man, Don Coyas, as he slept in the foothills of Southern Colorado. And as he slept, an eagle flew overhead and dropped a beam of light on his forehead. And the light just kept expanding, reaching from the sky to the earth. Within the light, there became a very small sprout that turned into a tree. And that tree moved through its different uh, becoming both from growing from uh, summer, fall, starting with spring, summer, fall, and then winter. And as you could imagine, then the leaves began to fall off. But in this tree, the limbs began to fall off. And what was left was one single stem that turned and moved horizontally to form a hoop, a symbol of the earth of the universe. And then another beam of light came down. And that dot of light touched the hoop. And as it touched the hoop, it turned into an eagle feather. And then more and more drops of light came. And as it touched the hoop, it turned into eagle feather to where there are 100 eagle feathers attached to this hoop. And then Don Coyas woke. And as all indigenous people do, is that when you have such a strong vision, you go and you speak to your community. We do nothing alone. That is an illusion. And so went to this community, um, 12 elders in South Dakota, the Turtle Clan, and told them what he, he saw in this dream. And they told him, this is a vision, and you must do that. And he said, well, that's another story. How do you get 100 eagle feathers? And indeed, it ended up being 101. But he put the call out all over the world, but it was clear in this vision that this was about the whole hoop of life. And so people, indigenous elders, from 27 of them came from all the different directions. They came from Europe. They came from Africa, came from Tibet, and then throughout the Americas. And together in that weekend, they built this hoop and hung 100 eagle feathers on it. They wrapped the four sections in the different colors of the people, of the races, and connected them together as one with one eagle feather, the 101st hanging from the center. They prayed, they danced, they chanted, they meditated in their different traditions, their different languages. And then at the end of this, as the fire was burning and a spirit told them, they put four gifts into the hoop for all humankind because spirit said, we will be entering a long winter, a winter like no other. There are no words that the two-leggeds will understand when I say this. And it's so important that the two-leggeds use these gifts because they have forgotten Human beings have forgotten how to be in right relationship with themselves, with other two-leggeds, and with all relatives, including the earth. And so they, one by one, they put these gifts into the hoop. The first gift is the power to forgive the unforgivable. The power to forgive the unforgivable. You may be even thinking about some of those things that may seem unforgivable. But with that expanding heart of yours, take the gift of the power to forgive the unforgivable and place it in the ceremonial part of your heart. The second gift they put into the hoop for all humankind to create harmony and balance is the gift of the power of healing. The gift of the power of healing such a tremendous gift that we can use every day. Put the gift of the power of healing into the ceremonial part of your heart. The third gift that they put into the hoop for all humankind is the gift of the power of unity. Unity it will take all of us to be part of. We come with our separate colored earth suits 
but for the two-leggeds, it's need, we need all of us. So put the gift of the power of unity into the ceremonial part of your heart. And then the final gift that they put, as Spirit instructed them, into the hoop was the gift of the power of hope. The kind of hope that compels you into action. Put the gift of the power of hope into the ceremonial part of your heart. These four gifts are to help us deal with the winter time, but even more important, to cause us to remember who we are, who we're to be, and how we're to do by using these gifts. So the elders began to, they were very happy and they began to leave. And they were saying to each other how they were excited to bring this back to their indigenous communities. But the embers rose again and what they heard from spirit is no, yes, take it back to your communities, but this is for everyone, all two leggeds, for us to have harmony and balance again, all two legged must be aware of this. So these gifts, as you have them sitting in the ceremonial part of your heart, just allow them to be there. And you might already be recognizing that maybe one of them stands out more than others. But just allow all four to be there. There is no right or wrong of these gifts. And the Spirit said, we need to use all four. I received these gifts in 1995 when I was, um, for, for decades, I would teach indigenous youth who were about to go into business about things that I taught in business, but how do you keep your values? How do you keep hold of who you are and what you are when you may be in places that seem antithetical to that? And at that gathering, this hoop was there. So these gifts will support you in your journey and I don't know what that looks like, your journey, but I offer to you to watch this short video so that you can see a little bit about more background about the gifts and about how they impacted my life. So if you could put on the video of the four sacred gifts. My kindergarten teacher asked, what are you going to be when you grow up? Here, draw it. My friend stood holding drawings of firemen, doctors, mommies. I knew what I was going to be when I grew up from my dreams, which showed people connecting their hands and hearts circling the earth. Everyone laughed. I knew this is what I was going to be when I grew up. As an adult, I was living that dream, filled with lots of experiences and connections to people all over the world. I was training and coaching leaders and their teams, bringing their minds and hearts together. After many years, my favorite executives who championed women and men of different backgrounds began to ask, why am I doing this? It hit me like a rock it echoed what I was feeling inside myself. In 1995, I found elders to talk to while volunteering at the American Indian Science and Engineering Society's annual conference. I'd ask them, what am I supposed to be doing? Should I be doing something else? On the second night of the conference, we all gathered to receive special gifts that came from the North, south, east, and west. I saw Henrietta, a most beautiful elder. I asked her, why won't you answer my questions? With her powerful and peaceful presence, she said, Anita, why would I tell you something that you already know? Henrietta, I am no different than these young students who are preparing to go to work and live in organizations whose ways are so different. I am Mexican and Indian. 
I need to come home more often to fill up and go out again. She smiled and nodded. The smell of sage and sweet grass drew me into the room. I became fully present for the first time in months as I saw a hoop with a hundred eagle feathers hanging in the center of the room and listened to a prophecy from over a hundred years ago about a time when the elders come from different directions to pray and sing together. He said, Remember, grandmother and grandfather make no mistakes. We each have a role to play. We are all part of one mother, one earth. We have been living in a great time of winter, and now we must prepare for the spring. There was silence. Then he began naming the four gifts for all humanity to help prepare ourselves and our communities. From the North, the power to forgive the unforgivable. From the West, the power of unity. From the East, the gift of healing. From the South, the gift of hope. Afterwards, I saw Henrietta and another elder. I don't have all the answers, do I? No, Anita, you think that the worst thing that has ever happened to our people was to have been murdered and to have our sacred land stolen. You are wrong. The worst thing that can happen to our people or to any people is to lose hope. Her words were like a spear of truth that hit and opened my heart. These four gifts have supported me through the good and the tough times. Forgiving my parents healed the little girl within me, for I was repeatedly hurt by my father from age four to 13. And I replaced the hurt with gratitude for my parents giving me life. Appreciating the similarities and the differences of those who I have taught and who have taught me built my understanding of the power of unity. One day, looking out from our deck, my youngest son said, Mom, you had a really tough childhood. And look at everything that you've done. Traveling all over the world, working with business leaders, and bringing people together. Wow, what is mine to do? What amazing things can I bring into this world? Take a breath, take a couple of deep breaths. And as you heard the prophecy and the four gifts, they're all very, very important. And there may be one that is calling to you, like in the foreground of a picture of a painting. 
And I think it's, we probably all know that it's best to answer those calls that actually create suffering when we don't. So I want you to make note of what that is as I share a little bit more about the gifts and then we'll have you have an opportunity for you to speak with one other person and then in some small groups on specific gift. Um, what I want to share is that this is a time like no other. I, in addition to weaving indigenous wisdom, prophecies with science, I want to be clear that prophecies do not predict the future. However, they do help us understand their timeless pa past, present, and future. It's all connected in one circle. Let us know what might possibly occur if we do not adhere to the original instruction, to the natural order, to the part that we are part of one hoop of life. And then growing up, that's always why my, my uncle would always make his arms in a big circle. It'd be horizontal, not like this, but like this, and always say, no one's higher and no one's lower. And of course, what we're experiencing is a lot of separation and a lot of powering over and disregard. So as leaders, and so I'm coming to you, speaking to you as leaders, leaders of your own life, leaders of organizations, leaders in communities, families, there's a lot being asked, but particularly of business leaders. And the latest um, poll that I saw at Harvard Business Review uh, reported that 57% of people polled said that they trusted business leaders. 50% said to solve the world's big problems and challenges. 50% said they trusted religion. 48% said they trusted government. Now, I've been around for a number of decades. And that's kind of extraordinary to see that kind of trust being placed in leaders, which means that leaders have to pay attention to how we be so that what we do is a reflection of that strength, that centeredness. So these gifts, as you saw in my own life, are very important. And I want to share one story, and then we'll get you into pairs. The story I want to share is for you, maybe there's some of you who are like, well, which one is the gift? What's one forward? And uh, I want to get it right. What, they all are important, and they're all intimately interconnected. But for purposes of conversation and responding, it's easier to move forward on one. So one of the things that I don't share in the story that makes these gifts um, so relevant and people asking me to speak is that when I was age 13, my father was murdered. And um, as you know from the video, which most people don't get to see, but what you understand is he was also my abuser. So it was a very confusing thing, but I will never forget um, when the police came to tell us that my father had been murdered. And what had happened is uh, he was an alcoholic, and so after work he would often go to the neighborhood bar around the corner and have a beer before he came home. And that summer in 1967, Earlier that day in that bar was a white man and a black man having an argument. And when my father showed up later that day, the white man returned and just saw the profile of his dark skin and shot three bullets through his head and killed him on the spot. Now, it probably still feels shocking in a way, but all of us have been made much more aware of what people of color have known for some time of the murder of people of color. So, that was horrific and uh, very confusing for me at 13. But the week after is the story I want to share. The week after the murder of my father, a white woman and her young white son came to the door. And he was, looked like he was around 13 my age. And she said to my mother, I had to come see you. I had to come ch tell you. My husband was a good man. He never would have killed your husband if he knew he was Mexican and Native American. But he thought he was black, and you know how black people are. And she started saying all these horrific things. And I never, I heard my mom scream. But I never heard her scream at a stranger before, but she did. And she just yelled and said, stop, stop. You don't even know what you're saying. You don't even know what you're teaching your son. But I want you to know I'm going to try really hard to pray for your soul, but you get off my porch. And she gathered all of us together that night my five other brothers and sisters, 
all of us between the age of 9 and 18. And she said to us, I'm going to speak of this, this one time, and not again. So you must listen with the softest part of your ears and expanding heart. She said, a white man murdered your father, not the white race. A white man murdered your father, not the white race. And then she opened the Kansas City Star, the news, local newspaper. And on there was pictures of my father in a pool of blood on the bar floor. She said, now this, this is racism. This is allowed by a collective, whole groups of people that allow this. When violence happens to people of color, it's put all over. But if violence happens in the city to anyone who's white, they would never show this. You are worthy of dignity. We all are worthy of dignity, the dead and the living. And this must stop. Fast forward. I had the dream that you saw in the video that I was going to connect hearts, all people all over the world. I didn't know that was called a PhD in organization development. I didn't know it was called diversity, equity, and inclusion work. But it was that dream that helped me, but also others who saw in me things that in my mind I was saying, oh, if they only knew, if they only really knew who I was. Maybe you had some thoughts of that. Or what am I supposed to do? Maybe you've had those kinds of questions lately. Nonetheless, I started very early in my 20s consulting to corporations all over the world. And I would create circles doing diversity, equity, inclusion work, where we'd heard circles of people of color sharing their experiences, their dreams. And we'd have circles of white people sharing their experience of the dreams. And I began hearing many white people, not all, but many, who said, my parents taught me that I'm better than you, people who look like we're in the circle before. And I love them, but I don't believe that. And some of them told us literally we were, and others by their absence of us. But they were doing something different. I was observing, not nearly fast enough, so don't hear that. But they were changing policies and programs and doing different things to, to have us work together, to understand we are one hope, and that the work of business is important business that impacts all of humanity. And so, what happened to me is I began having the dream over and over again of what I just described to you, the white women in the sun. And I could see everything vividly, but I could not see the white boy's face. It was horrible. His face was not there, but month after month, hearing these stories, his face became clearer and clearer to this day. I would know who this man was. And here's what I came to understand, and I'll close with this to get you into talking with each other in pairs. The young Anita was so filled with pain and hurt, with anger and all sorts of emotions, that even though I was doing this work in my 20s and still do it now today, back then there was a part of me who didn't believe it. I had a great vision, but the part of me didn't believe it. And what I learned is that this gift of forgiveness what seems unforgivable, for me it was individual, but it's also collective. Whole groups of people have had genocide and all sorts of horrific things to various people. But his face became really clear, and this is how I made sense of it. When we do not heal the hurts when we hold on to things that seem unforgivable, I was doing to that young white boy what his father did to my father. I took away his face. I literally took away his humanity. And what I came to understand back then, the adult Nita could understand what the 13-year-old had not, which was on that summer day in 1967, my five brothers and sisters and I lost my father. My mother lost her husband. And at, with a seventh grade education, she raised all six of us. But that summer day in 1967, that white boy lost his father too. 
and he grew up knowing his father was a murderer. I wish that man the best journey in his life. These gifts are not just nice things. These gifts that Spirit gave us through the 27 elders from around the world are meant for all of us. And so I ask you, invite you to continue listening to yourself and listening to others with the softest part of your ear and expanding heart as we're going to break you just randomly please stay on we really need your participation in pairs and the instructions in those pairs is you will just take two minutes each and share what came through for you and what gift is at the foreground and anything you wish to share with that it is totally confidential the specifics of what you share with that one person this will be just the first breakout. We'll have a larger breakout afterwards. But for now, what is the gift that's calling to you? Share what you wish to share with that. It's confidential with, with that person. And we'll see you back here in about four and a half minutes, four minutes. So whoever is with technology, this wonderful team, please break them into pairs. So not everyone's back, but we do have some um, some new faces. So welcome, Sayers, and welcome, William. Good. Welcome, all my new relations that I didn't have a face for before. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> and just to bring you up um, to what we're doing right now is we've been um, discussing the Eagle Hoop prophecy. I've been sharing that uh, prophecy that came from 27 indigenous elders from all over the world. And they gave four gifts they put into an eagle hoop with 100 eagle feathers. And these four gifts, Spirit said, was for all humankind, or two-legged, for human beings to remember, remember how to be in right relationship with yourself, other people, all our relationships, all, all the earth. So the four gifts are, because in a moment I'm going to ask you to answer a poll that's going to appear in front of you. The four gifts are the power to forgive the unforgivable, the power of healing, the power of unity, and the gift of the power of hope, hope in action. Those are the four gifts. And so for those of you who just arrived, just hearing them, not a lot of mental judgment, just allow it come from your heart. What one of those just, if it were a painting, just pops out in front? Forgiveness, healing, unity, or hope. And if you could put up the poll, then we'll allow people so you could all and it's anonymous, this poll, but if you could mark one that is um, calling to you the most, it could be multiple are calling to you, but if there's one that where it's a little more, just mark that down and then we'll get everybody's responses. And you do need to mark it to respond. You need to submit, hit submit, so that your, your response will get up there. And we'll just give it a, a few moments before um, hearing if it's ready for us to see. Which gift is calling to you? Let's share them. Yes, there we go. So in this community, 24% of you said the power to forgive the unforgivable is what was calling to you, tugging on your heart. 24% the power of healing, 24% the power of unity, and 29% the power of hope in action. There is none of these are wrong. They're all right. There is no one order. It really is about using all the gifts. And what you'll eventually find as you, um, they are, you already know, they all belong to you already. But as you begin to use, you, use them, you'll be able to see how intimately interconnected they are. I do want to say something because of this collective poll. It is different than what I see in other groups. So people usually want to know, is this similar or different? And then we're going to put you into small groups. What's a little bit different is that uh, overwhelmingly, unless it's young people, yeah, um, high school, overwhelmingly there is more people who put down hope and unity and very few put down forgiveness and very few put down healing. 
So the fact that this broke out in this way is just interesting in itself and that you can support each other in using these gifts. So with that, you'll let me know when you're ready um, to put up. What we're going to ask you to do is there's going to be questions, a facilitator in the different breakout rooms. We'd really like you to stay and be part of the breakout rooms. There are some three questions in each of those breakouts. The facilitator will make sure that everyone has a chance to speak. And so, um, but you get to check, uh, select which room you want to go into. And I'm going to turn it over to whoever is putting those up so that you can select whether you go into forgiveness, healing, unity, or hope. Welcome back, everyone. I think we have everyone back. So I'd like to invite you again to continue to listen with the softest part of your ears and expanding heart um, to yourself and to each other, to this wonderful community who has engaged so fully into exploring these gifts, um, some uh, with all of its beauty and messiness. So um, what we'd like to do is um, open it up to just hear, I think, from each of the groups what, what wants to be shared with the larger group. And um, I guess what we could do is just um, probably just let's, let's take each gift. That way we make sure to get some voices on each one. Um, let's go ahead and start with the, uh, the forgiveness uh, group. Um, and there's a facilitator in each room, so they may want to share some overarching things if they want, or just open it up to the other members. So in the forgiveness group, could you just put your hand by your face who was in the forgiveness room? It's like this. We're not going to use the electronic stuff there. Okay, so you could see there were a number of us there. All right, thank you, Patana Han. And um, the facilitator, any one of you want to? Yes, Kurt? Yes, thank you. It was a... Um... For me, the, the richness of a, of a conversation, one of the indicators is afterwards I'm speechless because I have to digest too much. And I think that's happened for me in our session. Uh, there was so much wisdom and, and richness and, and authenticity. Um, so, you know, what, what, so many things taking out, I think is some of the keys learnings or is you know, when you can forgive, you release a lot of energy, you make yourself free. Um, also the, the challenge sometimes of forgiving yourself, and that can sometimes be even a bigger challenge than forgiving other people. Um, yeah, the, the harm, maybe it's building the harm, we do ourselves also by not forgiving because we block part of our energy and we, uh, we don't allow ourselves to, to move forward. Um, and then also, which was also an interesting component, that you have the forgiving people and how does it relate to forgiving systems? Um, so yeah, that, that were my, my takeaways, but please, uh, you know, if other people want to add something, uh, feel free. Yeah, so others that were in that group, uh, I, I sat in on that group and um, I, part of my takeaway is that I think all of this is possible when I see people. Um, I know this is a controlled environment. You have colleagues here that you trust, but that you were able to go to a vulnerable place and share um, realities of your past life or and even of your current life that you're dealing with. So that's true for me. And I'd just like to repeat a couple of things just for those of you who didn't come to that room that I think are important is that, first of all, no one of these is more important than the other. They're all literally, they're all intimately interconnected. Um, and then you'll, you'll discover that one leads the other. And, but so just answer whatever, rather than judgmentally saying you must go this way, is just go to where your heart tells you. <laughs> you know, and you may cycle back a number of times and, and get through all of them, but, and then again and again. But forgiveness does not mean you're weak. There would be a lot more forgiving if people realized what it's not. So it's not you're weak. It doesn't mean you're betraying your people because some hurts are huge, collective, genocide and other things, or hurting the earth. Um, it doesn't mean that you forget. People think, well, I obviously haven't healed, I mean, forgiven completely because I haven't forgotten. Well, 
I'm never going to forget what happened to me. Those are huge things in my life that they don't have the charge and energy they did, but they, so you don't, it's not about forgetting. And it doesn't mean you don't seek justice. So even with, you know, that you can actually, what happens with forgiveness is you're freeing up energy that is stuck for what did or did not happen, hurts or mistreatment to you, others, whole groups of people, that when you release, truly release, not pretend, and there's no telling you how much time, how little or how much, decades a day, whatever it is, that that releasing of that gives you energy for now and for what you want to create. And it also, in that forgiving, also frees you up to be more open, to be able to be with others, to collaborate and to trust. So many things are connected to all these gifts. So I just wanted to share that because I that we spoke about that a little bit in that room, but I overwhelming for me was just a sense of community, a sense of willing to be vulnerable, a sense of speaking what seems maybe is unspeakable, but with a clear idea that forgiveness is a path. And um, I'll close with this with forgiveness and open it to anybody else before we move to the next gift. Um, so forgiveness is a pathway to freedom. Freedom, I never, it, it's so spectacular. It seems like I drank something, but no, I didn't. No, I didn't ingest anything. It was just releasing that. It, it's, a, um, it's a pathway to unconditional love. Sometimes that word gets thrown around, but to really know what that means, to unconditionally love yourself and then the capacity to unconditionally love someone else. And then what I learned from an elder at my last Sundance before COVID hit, Basil Braveheart asked me to include this in the next book. He said, yes, on all of that. And forgiveness, consider that forgiveness is a passcode to your divinity. And then when you think of all of that that comes out of forgiveness, it might help us, even though it still may be very difficult, it may help us to lean into that when our heart is calling for that, that work. So with that, um, unless there's somebody else wants to speak on forgiveness, let's move to healing. I don't see any hands go up on forgiveness. Okay, healing. Yeah, healing. Melissa. <laughs> Are you the I was on yes. healing too, but Peggy, you had your hand up too. Would you like to share? A... I was just saying I was part of the group. Oh, I see. Okay, I see. Yeah, let's put all your hands up who are part of healing so we can just see in the community all the people who are doing the work in healing. Good. All right. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to give a few highlights and then ask my group to also please help me fill in. Um, but so, you know, one of the questions that you asked was around, um, how do you know when something needs healing? So at the beginning of our conversation, we talked about feeling into our bodies and, um, the signals and signs that our bodies may give, and that can be through pains or aches in our bodies and what we can do to heal it through breathing and other types of exercises. And how, um, yeah, how our, how we tune into our bodies and how our bodies are the are are reflective of when we need healing. Um, we also talked a bit about feeling our emotions um, and um, that without feeling our emotions, we may not be able to heal. So, group members shared about trying to not feel into an experience like having a problem with someone or feeling overwhelmed by needing to support someone or um, feeling the emotion of just being overwhelmed by this last year. Um, so, so the feeling of the emotions is an, is an important part of the healing process. Um, and then we talked about uh, the link between forgiveness and healing and that um, brought us to a conversation around forgiveness. So it was nice to hear that group's um, remarks. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing I'll share related to that is that um, was an insight that um, forgiveness can only come from within. And um, yeah, I, I think I'll stop there. Are there others within my group that would like to add anything? Okay. 
Don't see any other hands. No, I think that's that's fine. That's fine. We want to honor you in that. Um, uh, I want to add on the healing part. You probably already spoke of it, but I know growing up and what I would um, learn from my elders who uh, were Nawa and then the Osage who took us in and stuff was that I was always told that there was good medicine and bad medicine. And that in every moment, in every breath, in every thought, in every action, we have a choice. And good medicine is anyone or anything that puts into alignment the spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical. And so, Melissa, when you were putting out for your healing group, I was like, oh, my Uncle Moro is here. He would smile because it's like it's all of those things. And bad medicine is anyone or anything that takes out of alignment that spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical. So I get to ask myself in terms of healing, what, what is out of alignment and what do I want to be? Good medicine to myself and others or bad medicine to myself and others? Well, I, then the other thing I want to share, so you all continue to go do the work in the healing, which is wonderful, as I not studied, it's impossible to study all the healing methodologies around the world, but I've been privy to a number of different ones, indigenous in particular, in different parts of the world. And I found there were at least four elements that were present for healing to occur. And one, Melissa, you spoke of it with your group, your team did, listening. You, you, you won't, how do you know unless you listen? And that's listening to your body, to your spirit, to your emotions, all of that. So that, that sounds simple, but, uh, and yet it's so important for us to learn to listen. And then the second thing is uh, supportive relationships. And those relationships could be two-legged human beings, but it could be in nature. And we've had found healing in all these different realms. The third thing is um, love, love of self. There has to be something that is, there's a schism happening there that uh, that love is wanting, which is so expansive, and who you really are is, is, is in motion. And then the final thing is action. So to get into healing, it's kind of like the GPS. When I first got it decades ago, I thought, well, why isn't it working? And I remember my partner saying, well, you've got to move the car. So to get into healing, you've got to be willing to be in that motion. So um, I just want to close with that. And thank you, healing um, group, for your conversation. Let's move now to, um, first of all, just take a breath. I can sense a lot of work happening in the different rooms. Just honor ourselves and take a breath. And then we'll move to the third gift, the gift of unity. And could you put your hands by your face so that all of us can see who is in that group with unity? Unity, okay, it was a smaller group. Okay, um, could you tell us what happened in those, and I see Elliot at the bottom raising his hand too, okay. Hey, Elliot, yeah, I, I would love for Elliot and also Ezra who were in the group to share on our behalf. <clears throat> Sure. I mean, I think that our group was reflecting on our personal definitions of unity, um, talking a little bit about both unity on the individual level and the unity in the communal level. Um, and I think recognizing there's a difference there, but there's also threads that connect them. And, and then I think we were also reflecting um, really about sort of the, the issues of how do you create unity in a, in a culture or in a time where there's disunity or tribalism. Um, and so I think this was one of the things that we, we discussed and, and delved into. Ezra, do you, Ezra or Kate, would you be anything else you'd want to add? You need to unmute yourself, Ezra. Thank you. Elliot, uh, you reflected on most of the things that we we, we talked, but um, I talked also more on how we uh, our inner reflection also is so important in unity, and uh, how we are um, once we are so much connected in the heart that we can get unity all you know. Uh, more close to the oneness and this is also part of the unity and how uh, the planet is can be uh, more um, unified if uh, one person can get close to unity and is unity can 
you know, can reflect to the others. And uh, I call that the, the COVID was uh, asking us to, um, to get unified because it's a transformation time and how aware we should be and uh, being in unity and being more peaceful and uh, anti this violation that's going on needs us to be unified. And actually that's where Elliot said, well, the question is, is how to become unified? You know, we're talking about unity, but the question is how to. And uh, this, this is where, you know, we came back to the, to the main room. So thank you. Katerina, did you want to add anything? Okay. It's just a thank you. Thank you, Unity Group. And um, this is where I remember when I joined the forgiveness group, I came in right when, um, oh gosh, what is your name? Yaman. Um, see my or see me? I'm not sure how to say it correctly. Apologies. Um, was saying, well, you know, these are so connected. And they are. They're intimately interconnected. And because I do get stuck in my head at times, I remember really for at least 10 years, kept trying to find out what did the elders forget, which was really, as I talked to the ones that were still alive, I said, spirit told us, spirit told us. So it's like I never could find them, right? So they're all intimately connected. But that's what these gifts are about, how to be in right relationship, how to be so very much connected to the unity. And so one of the pieces I will say as I work with, um, you know, leaders and companies and families and different people and on this thing is that part of the work is to get rid of the illusion of separateness uh, because for to, to have unity, that illusion will continue to create suffering and separateness so that it's impossible. So sometimes when I go to companies that they're like, well, we have this big vision and you know, I've got all these followers and we're making all this money, but something's not quite together. And part of it is the reconnection of heart that you spoke of, Ezra. Um, but also part of it is that uh, it, you can have a huge vision, you have lots of followers, and you will get stuck. It will not, it could be even bigger, more beneficial to life if you do your healing forgiveness also. And so that's what I'm seeing that people like move forward. So just a quick one on Unity, um, a high tech company a number of years ago hired us using positive psychology and I wove in indigenous wisdom. And what really with that work is they, they count the numbers. So they went from 25 billion to 29 billion in a flat market. You know, their uh, printers were becoming a commodity. But really what was the stories of what experienced when people got out of the illusion of being separate from each other all over the world, but that they could actually talk to each other. So they began getting connected relationship and heart. So the unity just boomed and things that took a year plus to happen from over a million dollar sales began happening in six months. But even more important is how they were being with their families. And in this unity, at, uh, uh, there was a man in, the, in it that had learned lots more about the appreciative inquiry and the indigenous wisdom woven together and took it back to Israel. And he was in, in the military at the time and he, um, when he wasn't working in this company. And his troop did really well and then when he was about to, he was finished with service, mm -hmm. he wrote an email to us, and I'll never lose that email, because what he said is before he left, the other platoons or whatever they call them, I can't remember in Israel what they call them, they all wanted to know, what did you do? Your group is so unified and so caring, and they're just in these difficult situations. They just seemed, there was this energy about them, and he said, oh, and he started to begin to teach them about appreciative inquiry and the indigenous of oneness and the illusion of separateness to always look for that. And then he ended his email saying, and Anita, we need to bring this to the Palestinians too. There is unity, you know, at work. So let's move to the last group um, to report out, which is hope. And how, put your hands by your face, those who are working on hope. See, there's a couple of you, yeah, four, three or four of you. Uh, let's hear from you a couple of minutes before we close of what you discussed. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Um, I facilitated this group. And um, we started by 
um, honoring you, Dr. Sanchez, and reflecting on this moment and the teachings of today, remembering who we are, and we agree to listen to each other with the soft part of our ears. And um, on the hope side, we each were able to present something in a thematic way about what we thought about hope. And we heard um, a little quote, for example, hope is an initiator and joy is a healer. And then another added on and said, well, yes, and hope and forgiveness go hand in hand and they are circular. And then we said, well, hope should also be approached in a realistic way. Um, not to be overly positive, but to be grounded and um, maybe to not be so naive. And then finally, we all were able to provide a concrete example of something that we witnessed or participated in for collective hope in action. And um, it was a very lovely session and perhaps either Jason, Myra, Sally or Yusuf would like to um, compliment what I have just said. We definitely, the rest of the group, I can see from the energy, want to hear at least some of those very hopeful things you named. So if a few of you would share a few of those, that would be great. You just need to unmute yourself. I can maybe quote, uh, uh, first of all, thanks. Uh, it was a trip uh, with the GPC, actually, to the Philippines. And uh, we visited this uh, school where we, have, uh, we had underprivileged uh, girls and um, then we saw the, the parents and it was just amazing to see it, it was unbelievable to, when you saw these confident uh, uh, um, very nicely dressed uh, clever girls it was unbelievable that these girls were the girls of the parents that we that we had seen just uh, just before and that stayed with me as a very powerful image of uh, of hope actually yes hope uh, in one generation you can you can you know shift from one condition to another that was one of many examples, but please go ahead, the others. We had great examples. Can someone courageously unmute yourself and just give us at least one more? It'd be a wonderful way to end this, to hear some, another hope, hopeful action that's happening. Could I invite Myra to speak of your, only if you're comfortable. Um, yes, Claudia. Um, thank you for doing such a beautiful job in describing what we discussed first and foremost. And uh, my example of collective hope in action is that, as uh, some of you know, I work with crystals. So um, during the elections, um, we, we work with my team on um, just uh, focusing on what were the intentions and um, what were the values that we wanted to see in the United States. So that definitely was kind of like something that lasted for a couple of weeks. Uh, we worked with crystals, we worked writing intentions, we worked with prayers and meditations. So that's it. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. Our, our time is closing and I wanna turn it back to Melissa to um, give some directions and then we're, those who can stay can listen to a song that's based on the four sacred gifts of the Eagle Hoop prophecy. Go ahead, Melissa, and thank you all. Thank you, Anita. First, I just want to thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and guiding us through this experience today. It's been amazing. And um, we're posting in the chat the website where you can learn more about the four sacred gifts. It's foursacredgifts.com and also connect to Anita. Um, but before we leave, I also wanted to share with you a special announcement that we have a gift for participants of the Synergos Global Gather Gathering. We have pre-released one episode of the upcoming podcast series, Synergos Cultivate the Soul, Stories of Purpose-Driven Philanthropy. Um, a few of our guests for, of the series is on the call, Peggy, Ezra, and Julianne. And the full 10 episode series will be uh, available on July 1st. So you can listen to this series on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. Um, so also in the chat will be a link to this pre-released episode that features Beauchamp. 
Um, I also just want to announce that in 30 minutes after this session, we'll have our last session of today, which will feature Henri's interview of um, Rigo Berta Menchutum, who's the Nobel Peace, Peace Prize laureate um, from Guatemala. And we'll continue our conversation about indigenous groups and wisdom. So thank you so much, Anita.